Penguin Random House Audio presents 30 Million Words, Building a Child's Brain. Tune in, talk more, take turns. By Dana Suskind, M.D., Beth Suskind, and Leslie LeWinter Suskind. Read for you by Kathleen McInerney. Chapter 1. Connections. Why a Pediatric Cochlear Implant Surgeon Became a Social Scientist. Blindness separates me from things. Deafness separates me from people. Helen Keller Parent talk is probably the most valuable resource in our world. No matter the language, the culture, the nuances of vocabulary, or the socioeconomic status, language is the element that helps develop the brain to its optimum potential. In the same way, the lack of language is the enemy of brain development. Children who are born hearing, but in an austere language environment, are almost identical to children who are born deaf, who have not received a rich sign environment. Without intervention, both can suffer the critical, lifelong effects of silence. On the other hand, children in a rich language environment, whether born hearing or given the gift of hearing via cochlear implants, can soar. My Story the irony is not lost on me that a pediatric cochlear implant surgeon is writing a book on the power of parent talk. Surgeons are known for many things. Talk is not among them. Rather than words, we are defined by our hands, our dexterity in the operating room, and our ability to identify problems and find solutions. To a surgeon, there is nothing more gratifying than when the puzzle pieces fit just so. Cochlear implantation, allowing a child born deaf to hear, is an extraordinary example of all those components. Coiled two and a half times around the snail-shaped cochlea, the organ where the nerve part of hearing begins, a cochlear implant successfully skips over the defective cells, the point along the hearing pathway where sound had come to a screeching halt, going directly to the acoustic, or hearing, nerve the superhighway that connects the ear to the brain. The amazing result is that a child born into silence now has the ability to hear, to talk, and to meld into the world both educationally and socially. The cochlear implant is a puzzle piece that fits just so, a miraculous solution to total deafness. At least, that's what I thought. In medical school, it was the brain, not the ear, that captured my imagination. The brain seemed a profound mystery, holding the key to all the unanswered questions about life. My dream was to be a neurosurgeon, fixing with my hands some of the most important and vexing issues facing humanity. My first neurosurgical case in medical school did not, however, go smoothly. The chief of neurosurgery, Dr. R., had invited me to scrub in on a meningioma resection, the removal of a benign brain tumor. We'd been writing a textbook chapter on meningioma resection, and he thought it might be helpful if I actually saw one. When I came into the operating room, Dr. R. gestured me toward the operating room table, where a shaved head, stained with the yellow and red of betadine and blood, confronted me. Inside a large gap of missing skull, a grayish gelatinous mass pulsated rhythmically, as if trying to escape its bony confines. The patient's torso had disappeared completely, like a magician's assistance, under long blue drapes. As I walked toward the patient, I suddenly became aware of my own pulsations. Could this blob of overly congealed gelatin really be the epicenter of who we are? Dazzling lights crisscrossed my vision, and I could barely register what Dr. R. was saying. The next thing I knew, I was being lowered onto a chair by one of the surgical nurses. Humiliating? You bet. But that was not the reason I did not go into brain surgery. Ultimately, that was more a fantasy-meets-reality decision.